I grew up in a place where there were, were actually waka everywhere. There were waka that used to come out of swamps, just sticking out of the mud in paddocks and paddocks and that sort of thing. Sometimes we used to pull them out. We did have one waka, I think it was a waka tete, a really shallow waka for getting around and we used to use that when we were kids when we were swimming. When I was a really young, young boy I was really interested in, in just making things and, and um, most of the time pulling things apart and putting them back together again. I was interested in um, setting things out and putting things in their place. I was actually quite obsessive as a kid, um, just arranging things, organising things, um, just um, looking. Sometimes I'd just, um, my mother would always give me a slap or grab my ear because I used to just wander off but I'd be, I'd be stuck like this for half an hour, an hour sometimes. I teach a kind of discipline called computational design, so I use a lot of digital tools to try and gauge where the future of architecture lies in terms of um, uh, how the computer can play a part in the authorship of a building, from the early stage design right through to the making of that building. I'm also a primary investigator for the McDiamond Institute. It's a science-based institute that looks at different properties of, of materials at the nanoscale. Um, they're interested in the research that I do because it helps to reconnect people with places and, and with materials, but at a really low-fi level. So you're working with raw materials um, and you're working with the communities who relate to those materials. Quite often those linkages or connections have been lost to those materials and, and working those materials over the years because of uh, factory models and, and those sorts of things and industrialisation that have separated and, and created distance between um, people and materials, communities and materials. I always wanted to be an architect. I wanted to build things and I wanted to build really big things, like making enclosures and just making big structures. My area of research uses 3D printing especially and, and um, large-scale machines like uh, robots and um, large-scale 3D printers. And it's because of an invitation from Hemi Eruera to um, see how 3D printing might inform the future of making, especially making, making waka. And he learned that the Smithsonian Institute had an over 200 year old, um, what's called the Hawaiian wa'a, a voyaging craft of waka, um, in their possession that they had scanned and made a digital file of. So they very recently made that available to me. And um, so my role has been to look at how that might be printed one to one scale, so full size. Um, the real big challenge around going full size because you, you have to find the right materials, they have to perform in a certain way. We've had a few issues with the printer getting 95% and then stopping all of a sudden. But it's been pretty amazing to see this um, wa'a come from a set of data into um, sort of a real object that people can touch and feel. Um, even though we don't have the true texture or the weight, it's interesting to hear the conversations we're having around um, this replica or duplication of the wa'a itself, and especially from the point of view that it's, um, it's very different to how the, the carvers are working out the back. Um, they're engaged with the material the whole time. Um, as you've seen, there's, no, there's hardly any engagement except you're, you're engaging with printers, you're, you're trying to fix up technical problems, um, you're changing hardware over, you're doing all those sorts of things. We were approached and asked if we wanted to host Tuku Iho, this traveling Maori show. And we said yes, and that happened. And then through that process, um, James and his crew came and we were gifted a waka. And so I got to know James and um, took him to our stores. And um, we happened to have in our collection the world's oldest known Hawaiian outrigger canoe, which was gifted to the Smithsonian in 1887 by Queen Kapiolani. When he unveiled it to me, I kind of got really excited. And I was that excited, I kind of ran outside where there was signal and I, um, I video messaged uh, Arika Bumate in Hawaii. And I, you know, I kind of said, bro, you know, there's this beautiful Hawaiian wa'a here, and I think it's worthy of a look at from you guys. And so we cooked up a project 
that brought James and two of his students from Aotearoa to DC, and then we brought Ray and Alika, and we ended up uh, meeting up and re-rigging the canoe to look at kind of how it was made and to just have conversations about the canoe and then just thinking about it within the larger context of revitalization. We talked about, well, what does a 3D scan mean? What do we do with it? Can we print it? So there's a whole conversation around that. And then uh, shortly after that, I came home and met uh, Derek Kawati, which was kind of a random one. Well, maybe not so random. Maybe the one I just wanted us to, maybe the whole project just wanted to play itself out with all of us in tow. And we had conversations with Josh at the Smithsonian and our Hawaiian whānau, and, you know, the output was this 3D print of uh, the Kapiolani Wa'a. We had to provide clarity around the way that we were printing and what that would give rise to. So we haven't been able to alter the file at all. Um, the exact terminology was an enhanced print. So the Smithsonian was sort of saying, well, you can have a number of enhanced prints, uh, but at the end of the day, you must print it true to what the file is that we've given you. But the thing is, it's totally different to the original. Obviously, it has no color, weight, um, the textures are different. This is one of the largest 3D Cartesian printers that you can get. Um, it's really useful for um, enabling us to um, investigate scale. And so uh, once you investigate scale with, with materials, they start acting differently. Um, when you're sort of printing with smaller objects, they don't really give you as much feedback as the, as the larger objects do. Unlike um, working with the real material where you can uh, work and get feedback straight away, you've got to wait for a certain time for things to, to happen. Um, so there's a bit of anxiety around that. All this automation and um, printing, what does it replace? I mean, quite obviously it, it might replace the role of the craftsperson in, in building a, a waka or, or wa'a. And so what significant traditional customary roles does it take away and what does it replace it with? It is a bit of a solitary process, and you do shut yourself away from other people a lot. Um, you get buried in um, uh, like workflows and processes, mainly with computers. You start thinking about the technical aspects of what you're doing quite a bit. So the mathematics of it, proportion, scale, all those sorts of things, um, and the relationships between abstract ideas and the real object that you're printing. Oh, I just had a fail. It's um, a really nice materiality, but the, the, the step up and the layers was too fine. We're quite limited at the moment um, with the bioplastics that we, we have access to. Total bugger. Okay. Yeah. The way to give yourself more options is to go larger in your printing. So bigger nozzles, you're extruding different kinds of materials, clays, soils, those sorts of things. Um, wood chips, you know, we took um, some of the wood chips from offcuts from what was being thrown away from the actual hewing of the waka and, and um, that are happening out the back and created a paste and then our plan was to, to print with it. And then you've got to deal with um, the actual, what the, what the material's going to do. Um, so you get to use these very raw materials. We got some of the um, silt and mud from the hotel river just running past the Hihioa and, and um, so we took that back and we're trying to mix that with some of the wood chips. That's really exciting because you actually do get your hands on, on these materials, on the clays, you, you sort of get a, a feel for viscosity, um, the density, and is it going to go through the nozzle, how much pressure do I need, um, where do I need to bring in other you know, experts, engineers and, and so forth to um, aid the process. We did attach one of our injectors onto the robot down at Victoria and we nearly um, exploded the, the injector casing itself. We can't really make any assumptions, you just have to test them out. You can't sort of say they're going to work or not going to work. When the waka and the wa'a launch, our wa'a is not going to be in that flotilla. We don't really want to um, degrade or, or lower the perception of the original through a really, you know, a kind of like a bad not a bad, but a draft clone that we've made or a draft um, replica. The thicknesses of the wood have been in the construction all come out in this final yeah. print. All the traces of the original craftsperson here. Yeah. Um, and we're printing a wood filament, so we're trying to get it as close to the natural like properties of the original thing itself. I have fears that, that 
what I do it will be really stink and won't be good enough. And so the last thing I want to do is to work with a, a pattern or a form um, and then turn it into a horrible, you know, just not do it justice. Obviously this is not voyage worthy, mm. but it, it will be. We can actually look at how that might be achieved next. Figure out a way of printing that has um, integrated structure, so you're mimicking the right. natural structural yeah. capacity of, of wood. I think Māori are already computationally attuned. I just think through the way we use materials, really um, we understand them um, the same way that a computer kind of um, searches and finds criteria within its search field and environment. Māori carvers and, and craftspeople, especially artists, um, have that same computational feel for materials and working with materials. Making decisions are really quickly, following them through, allowing them to, to speak as the materials they are and, and so forth. Our hope for the future is that some of the young people that start adopting these technologies are really critical and assess them in a way that um, you're always measuring them up against um, tikanga Māori through your own cultural lens um, and not just sort of taking it for granted without sort of casting a critical lens over um, what, what the implications of these things will be uh, for our people. Tēnā koutou irirangi te motu i te pūtia tautoko kā rawe.